So let's talk about the Mead Senior Footballers. I mean, a mixture in many ways for the Mead Senior Footballers in 2021. I mean, you know, they showed some positives, especially against the Dubs, obviously, in that second half performance. But overall, it probably would have been a disappointing year in many ways for Mead fans, especially with the Senior Footballers. I know the Miners and obviously the ladies team had an exceptional year. And certainly Mead uh, were on the map in more ways than one in 2021 with what they achieved but in terms of the senior footballers definitely some ups and downs in the past couple of years for Andy McEntee's men and certainly a lot of pressure going in to 2022 now for Andy McEntee for the team and especially a bit of pressure going into what will be a, quite a difficult division too with the fact that you've got obviously Galway, Ross Common, Clare, Derry a lot of very good teams in there and it's going to be very tough to see how Mead managed to I suppose go on a bit of a run and get out of there. I was delighted to speak with Davey Rispin of the We Are Mead podcast and we broke down the Mead footballers ahead of the upcoming 2022 GA season. We previewed them ahead of the Division 2 campaign. How might they get on in the Leinster Championship as well? Can Mead finally close the gap on the dubs? That was the big discussion. That were some of the big talking points. So without further ado, let's get straight into it. Before we get straight into the podcast, I just want to give a huge shout out to our sponsors, D Kirby GA Star. Declan Kirby GA Star Championship Journey. It's a series of GA team children's books written by primary school teacher and GA coach Michael Egan. You can check it out in the link in the description down below, of course, as well. Follow the trials and tribulations of Declan Kirby and his team at Smith Green Gaelic Football Club, recently formed a promising GA team. The book is now available in Easton's and all good bookshops, so check it out in the description down below. And let's get straight into it okay so i'm delighted to be joined here by davy rispin of the we are mead podcast to preview the mead senior footballers ahead of the upcoming 2022 intercounty ga season we'll also be touching on the hurlers as well a little bit towards the end of the podcast but obviously we'll mainly focus on the footballers davy how's life anyways i suppose intercounty is only uh, around the corner yeah thanks a million for having me i suppose uh yeah it is when you think about it O'Barn cup is only a matter of uh weeks away i think mead are getting ready for a duel with Wicklow in, in Bray on uh, Sunday week. So that's going to be the next one on the agenda and hopefully get ourselves ready for a, a big Division 2 campaign coming up. Yeah, I suppose. I imagine there's a, a feel-good factor in me at the minute anyways after last year, I suppose, winning the, the minor title, the ladies winning that Hot Horland as well and the way they won it and the story and everything behind it. So I'd imagine there's, a, I suppose, a bit of a good, you know, a feel-good factor in me, which probably wasn't there maybe in previous years. Yeah, it's, it's a funny one, really, because I suppose there was a little bit of a feel-good factor after the, the defeat to Dublin in the semi-final, just on the nature of the second-half performance. But realistically, the kick only came after, as you say, with the minors and then the ladies, which was extraordinary, really, um, in, in beating Dublin. But the story in which like they only came up from intermediate the year previous, they've done back-to-back -back promotions from Division 3 to 1, it was an amazing fairy tale story. And there was no sort of, as Eamon Murray often says to us, there was no flukes about it. You know, they deserved it all. And um, the minors was a great boost as well for us. We've been competing well at Leinster level, but to get an All-Ireland in the, in the back pocket was huge. And we need to kick on now at under 20 level. So you're right. That should definitely give us a bit of a boost going into this year at senior level. I do think the success that we may be seeing at minor level could be a couple of years away yet. You, you have to sort of be patient, but it's, it's good signs, it's positive signs for sure. I suppose the Mead ladies as well, like they showed really anything is uh, anything is possible in many ways, I suppose, in, in Gaelic games. I could imagine the, you know, the senior, the men's senior footballers will certainly take a lot of confidence, I'd imagine, from seeing what they achieve, like toppling Dublin and coming all the way from intermediate level. So I'm sure there's a there's a real story there to, to work off for the, for the men's footballers now in 2022. Yeah, and there's a few of the lads that are going out with the, the girls as well. So uh, I'm sure they'll be quick to remind them of it as well, you know. But um, absolutely, there is. They went out and they, they sort of had a blueprint um, or a game plan for how they wanted to go about their things. And they executed it to perfection. You know, the, the level of fitness that they, they showed, um, a lot of people didn't think they could sustain it, you know, over 60 minutes against Dublin. And that was always going to be the test. And it was only on over the weekend there. I watched the pack and it was amazing, you know, because Dublin are such a great team, probably similar to the lads in many respects as well. The run they were on, go five in a row. Um, it was just an amazing fairy tale story, as I said already. Um, it's going to be a completely different dynamic for the ladies now next year because they're not going to be the darlings of the country anymore. The likes of Dublin and Cork and 
you know, Armagh, Waterford, teams like that are going to have it in for them. So they're going to have a completely different approach to it. But I've no doubt they'll, they'll you know, just go about their business as they have and, and do well. And hopefully the lads can take a leaf out of their book. Yeah, and I suppose sometimes maybe through the years there's been some maybe some questions over me in terms of how they're doing things behind the scenes. And I know at the start of the year there was a little bit of controversy around the under-20s, but having seen the minors and having seen the ladies as well and obviously having seen the improvement of the, the mid senior footballers, the men's footballers and some of the young players coming through, like I suppose there probably is a lot you are doing right, you know, whereas maybe a few years ago or maybe even at the start of the year, you know, often Mead got a bit of criticism and whatnot. So I suppose this probably proves that, you know, you are moving in the right direction and there certainly is some uh, some improvements there. I, I think you're right. Uh, we, do, we do sort of have to learn from our mistakes. Um, the under-20s was really regrettable, I think, um, because of the way it, it sort of panned out. That shouldn't really have happened and that was a decent group of players who were put in a really awkward position and um, Barry Callan and Sean Kelly went in there two weeks before the first round against Dublin um, and tried to patch things up and I actually think if they had another three or four weeks at it they, they may well have got a little bit more joy because they were competitive against Dublin and y- you know the way it went obviously with Offaly it, it was probably open to, to go on a run but that didn't materialise and then what happened with Andy McEntee only a couple of months ago, you know, with the the vote of no confidence from the county board was something that nobody in Mead really expected at that stage. You know, we'd been knocked out since, what was it, July? July since Dublin beat us. And for this to materialise, you know, a couple of months before the start of the new season, um, thankfully for Andy and for the players and stuff that the clubs reinstated them, they obviously voted them back in unanimously. So, um, those are the sort of aspects that we need to learn from probably at a, at a county board level and ensure that that doesn't happen again because it's only getting in the way of all the good things that are happening on the field if you if you will yeah I suppose maybe like like how would you look back on on 2021 then in total for the for me senior footballers for the men's footballers I mean I suppose like what you said, that great performance against the Dubs in the, the final 10 to 15 minutes. And But I suppose like overall, how would you look at it, looking at the league as well? Yeah, the league was disappointed. I, I won't lie to you there. Um, it was it was really kind of shortened down. And t- to be honest, there's probably more of an emphasis on the league for the likes of Mead than there is on for, for a Dublin or Kerry of this world. Because we're in Division 2 and the onus is to get into Division 1 and trying to, to sustain our place in Division 1. And and maintain our status here. We we won the two games that there was in the shortened league against Westmead and Down. The Westmead game was really tight. We won by a point, probably fortunate enough to do so. Down was very impressive. And then we went into a, a, a promotion playoff, essentially, against Kildare and Newbridge and didn't really perform. We're, we're outclassed on the day. I, I know the margin of victory, I think, was only three or four points, but realistically, they were a good seven or eight points better than Mead, which is really disappointing. Um, and that was everything for me. Like it's going to be in 2022, promotion is going to be the number one goal because we knew going into Leinster, there was no back door. So essentially, we were always going to be up against it if we played Dublin in the semi-final or final. That was The likelihood was that was going to be our year done and dusted there. So for, for a team like me, the promotion is going to be everything and that's going to be the number one sort of benchmark of what Andy and, and the lads are going to be judged upon, I would say, for 2022 as well. Yeah, and looking at that performance in particular against Dublin in that Leinster semi-final, I know as a as a Dublin fan myself, it was uh, it was a weird game to watch because in the first half it was looking exactly like last year and the year previous where it was looking like it was going to be one-sided. And to be fair, I was kind of happy in some ways it was a game in the end because you do miss the, the Dublin and, and Mead rivalry down the years and how competitive it usually is. But um, yeah, the second half was was an interesting one. Like I think Dublin only hit two points or something up until extra time. And you know, I'm not gonna lie, he's definitely had us on the ropes there for uh, for a few minutes going into the final, few, you know, stages. I remember even the the camera went on on Andy McIntyre, and he looked like a man that was, I suppose, you know, the day before Christmas or something. You know, all of a sudden he looked, uh, he looked like he, he you know, he, he realized it was a serious opportunity there. Well, Andy was trying to, because I remember we played Longford the game before that in Navan, and Andy watched the game from the top of the stand, and he was he was trying to do the same against Dublin. But the way Andy is, he's so passionate, he couldn't stay there when it got tight. He had to come down onto the sideline or whatever. But yeah, I, I mean that was that was great. But 
uh, you know, s- still tinged with a with a hint of disappointment on the first half display, you know, because we all know me, they're capable of that in the second half, which is great to see because I think going into the game, me, me supporters felt that they could really rattle Dublin. Um, and that first half performance really was was horrendous, you know, and thankfully they came out in the second half a completely different side and I suppose showed what they can do. Um, obviously, you need to do that over 70-odd minutes to, to really compete and try and beat Dublin. But for me, the most heartening thing was actually seeing the Dub supporters there and realising that they're in a the game and, you know, actually having to cheer on their side, like, really passionately in the last five or six minutes. It's something that I certainly haven't seen in a Dublin or me game for the guts of 10 years now. Um, so that was nice. And, and like that too, the Dublin supporters there, they want to be in a game. They want to see you know, a really competitive game in Leinster. They, they don't want to see turkey shoots all the time. It's it, That's grand from time to time, but you, you kind of want to see really competitive action. And th- I think that's what it was in the second half of that game. Yeah, and I suppose depending on who you ask on either side of the dublin Mead border, I mean, some people will say Dublin were really bad. Some people will say Mead were really good in the second half. Where where do you think, uh, I suppose, that I suppose the answer to that question lies? Yeah, well, well, at the time you kind of felt she's me. They were excellent in that, and then it's only probably now when you look back on the way the year the year panned out for Dublin that you said maybe they were on the decline a little bit. Um, but in the first half you wouldn't have said that, and I suppose uh, you know credit to me, it would have been easy as you say to to lie down and probably take the beating that they'd got for you know most of the last decade. Um, the goal from Matthew Coslo at the start of the second half was a thing of beauty. You know, Kyogi was was brilliant at slipping it off to him, and then he dummies coming for it. It was a great finish, and it just gave us a little bit of hope. And then O'Sullivan and, and Jordy Morris came into the game defensively. Me, the excellent. There was the big hit by Shane McAtee. Um, I can't remember on which Dublin player it was, but that was a, that gave a huge lift to the supporters as well. And um, yeah, it was it was just heartening to see you. Look, you're not you're not out there for moral victories or anything like that. And the biggest regret for me was that me didn't have the qualifiers to go back into two weeks after that because I suppose historically in years gone by, after being bet by Dublin, generally speaking, you get you lose in the next round of the qualifiers because of the margin of victory defeat. Sorry, but had me had qualifiers to fall back on, I genuinely think they could have went on a bit of a run and they could have carried on with some positive momentum. It, look, and I know the way the year was, that wasn't to be. But hopefully, you know, if we if we aren't to topple Dublin in Leinster next year, that we definitely can be ultra competitive again and look for a run in the qualifiers. I think that's that's what most Mead supporters realistically would be um, would be targeting and promotion, of course, in the in Division Two. I suppose, yeah, for Andy McIntyre, like I suppose that's been the the big problem, isn't it? Like in in the Leinster Championship in the past two years, the fact that there hasn't been qualifiers, like you've kind of had that, I suppose, inevitable you know, end in many ways, like all the other counties in, in Leinster, just because of how far Dublin are ahead. So I'd imagine in 2022, like having qualifiers back there as well, like at least if you do go out to Dublin and you give a good performance again or whatever way that game goes, or even if you play each other, we'll, we'll see how it pans out. At least you'll have the qualifiers there to go on a bit of a run potentially and maybe make a quarter final or, or possibly more. Yeah, and I think that's why it's it, the championship is so important for the likes of Mead and, and Kildare and you know, a few other counties who just aren't at that level, yes, but they're on the cusp of it. And the only way they're going to get there is by playing games and getting a bit of momentum and getting the quarterfinals, semifinals of the All Ireland and and seeing where it takes them. Um, but that uh, in the same vein, that's why Division One football for the last couple of years has been also important and it's evaded us. You know, it's no coincidence that in 2019 we were in Division One. Okay. You know, we didn't win a game, but we were really competitive in the games. Uh, that coincided with a run to the Super 8s, you know, the year before, which... So, basically, what I'm getting at is Division 2 promotion in 2018 resulted in a, in a run to the Super 8s. And, again, we didn't win a game in the Super 8s, but we were very good in, in the three games for a spell against Donegal, Mayo and Kerry. Um, so... OK, when we get to Division 1, it's grand being competitive, but we, you sort of have to get a couple of results. And I do feel that one big result for me, that doesn't necessarily have to be against Dublin. It can be against Mayo, Kerry, Donegal, Tyrone, whoever it is. But that, that will sort of be the that will be the making of this me team, I think. They just need one sort of Division 1 scalp at, at some stage and that will really bring them on, I think. Yeah, and I suppose like I'd imagine consistency is a big thing for... 
Mead as well because even even in some of those games against Dublin down the years where Mead have been coming in on a back of a, a couple of highs and although Dublin have been brilliant in those games I think Mead you'd have to say in a lot of those games have probably massively underperformed and even last year at times as well like the Kildare game I know you had a lot of injuries and whatnot in that game I think you finished with 13 men or something like that and obviously you know it was a tough game but even then again like that performance was probably a little bit poor so I'd imagine that's a big thing for for Mead supporters this year is to see a bit of consistency in the team hopefully and then you know then you can kind of build and improve on that yeah yeah you're right I, I think it is it is something that Andy will be looking to address it's just the, the fact that they can be brilliant one day and they can blow a team away we've seen it in the last couple of years in Leinster they've hammered Wicklow by 30 odd points and done the same to Longford nearly then 12 months later and then they go into you know the next game against Kildare or Dublin or whoever it is and they don't replicate that sort of level of performance um, the, the most frustrating thing I think for the supporters is that we all know that they have it in their locker but it's just replicating that game to game and, and consistently over the 70 odd minutes which is what's eluded us really to this point but it's, it's a settled enough squad there's going to be a few additions in there and the minors it's probably a little bit too soon to see any of those guys that have come through in the last couple of years back to back Leicester champions um, but I would say in the next and in, in the next year or two, we should start to see them coming through, and that's only going to really add to to the sort of quality and depth of the squad, and that's probably something that needs to be uh, addressed as well, maybe. Yeah, and I suppose the Andy McIntyre situation as well. You alluded to it earlier, like a very, I suppose, bizarre situation in many ways. You think after that performance against Dublin, like you know, he'd have a, a full vote of confidence, and they'd be building towards. 2022 like fair enough it hasn't probably all you know there's been some tough days I'm sure for Andy McEntee as mead manager as well and it hasn't been all perfect but I suppose I'd imagine for yourself seeing that all develop it was a bit of a, a mad situation it's just the timing of it Paul to be honest because I mean had this had this happened or this conversation happened in in August or September in the aftermath of that defeat to Dublin then you could you could understand it to an extent um I think it was November when it when it came out came around and then it opens up all the questions. Well, was there a replacement lined up from what I'm led to believe? I don't think there was. So, so you're saying a guy would have come in probably at the end of November, start of December, club championships are all done. If he's an outside man from outside the County, how is he meant to recruit and, and look to build a squad of his own there without the time to do that? And next year is such a big year for me we've already talked about that it, it wouldn't really make much sense Andy was there for another two years this will be his second of the two um and it was just the timing and, and that's sort of what um puzzled most Mead supporters out there and, and thankfully the club's seen sense as well you know the, I think he had 75 80 percent of the club's backing which is huge you know he only lost the vote of the vote by eight votes to seven of the executive, you know, so there wasn't exactly a massive margin in that. Um, and and for me, it was all just the time and it was completely bizarre and so unexpected as well. And probably a distraction for obviously for Andy, but for the squad as well, who at that stage were probably starting to, you know, I, I think they were actually starting to do a little bit themselves. You know, some of the guys who were probably knocked out of the championship three or four weeks previous with their clubs were actually starting to do another bit of gym work and stuff. So he had his plans made and everything. It was it was just the time in which was bizarre. But look, thankfully we could put that in the past and hopefully kick on with twenty twenty two now. Yeah, because I'd imagine like there'd be a bit of a I suppose a bit of added pressure maybe on him maybe going into twenty twenty two following that whole situation. Like you'd feel like if there's a bad result or if things maybe don't go according to plan in Division Two, all of a sudden then there's there's that added pressure. Um, so I'd imagine like for Andy McIntyre, it's probably unneeded pressure and unneeded pressure for the Mead squad really going into 2022 because you'd, you'd have to feel that that pressure really shouldn't be there, you know, especially from your own county board or whatever. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, no, and Andy and no and the lads as well, they could use that as a, as a bit of motivation as well, though. Um, and they could they could treat that as a way to drive them on. But yeah, yeah right. If, if things if we don't hit the ground running in Division 2, I mean, we have a tough away day to Galway first, which which will probably set the tone. The, the likes of Cork, Common, Derry are very good up and coming side awfully. There's some very decent sides in Division Two next year. So if we're, if we're not at it from the start and 
you know, you lose the goal the first day out, you're already chasing. The, the flip side of that is if you go to Salt Hill and get a win or a positive result, suddenly, you know, you have four games to come in Nav and there's every chance you can go on and, and achieve promotion. And suddenly, you know, all is rosy again going into the Leicester Championship. So it goes back to what I've been kind of harping on about the league is, is going to really be, be massive for me. Um, and, and it could go either way. You know, we've seen teams struggle, you know, the way that it was last year. I, I didn't really agree with the likes of a team could have won one of their two games and ended up being relegated then. Um, the likes of Westmead, for example, who are a decent side. We, we've seen them actually playing well in Crow Park against Kildare in the, in the semi-final and they ended up getting relegated to Division 3. And then with the with the um, the championship restructures coming in, you know, at the end of this year, I think it or next year, sorry, that that's going to really the likes of Cavan, for example, you know, in Division Four, it just shows how how important the league can be. And if you're if you're not sort of at it, despite the fact Cavan were in an Ulster Championship final the Christmas before that, um, I got to a got to a semi final against Dublin. You know, you, you can slide and. Uh, that's that's just why for the likes of me that and a, and a few other sides, league football is is arguably more important than championship at the moment. Yeah, and you mentioned Division Two there, um, and Galway on the first day. I think it's Russ Common after that, but you know it might be a good time to play Galway at the same time as well because Galway have obviously I think they've only beaten one team since the pandemic, and that is Russ Common. They beat them twice last year. So it might be a great time to play them at the same time. Like it's kind of a tricky game for, for Galway in, in the same sense. They haven't exactly been shooting the lights out on all cylinders in, in the past year or so. So I'd imagine it's probably a good good first game to get as well. Like get that game over and done with. And like what you said, if you lose, fair enough, maybe you're chasing. But if there's a win, then all mm. of a sudden you're you're up there and you're probably fighting for first, if not second. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Like, you know, and, and we'll we'll have a good look at them in the O'Baron Cup and uh, Galway will be in the FBD, but um it it is a huge game, you know, for both. You're right, for both, because Galway it's a home game, they'll want to hit the ground running and win that game. Meads to go there and get a positive result, it would just set the tone for the campaign. I think the big thing for us is we have four home games versus three away, and the teams that we have in Navin are probably um the, the games in which you'd want the likes of Cork, uh, Derry, and Roscommon coming to Nav, and you know they're they're three big teams that you wouldn't exactly want to be travelling to to play and try and get results. We're, we're quite good in Nav, and we have a very good record there. And um, there's no reason why we couldn't win those three games. I think we're away to Clare and Offaly as well. So, you know, those games are, are very winnable as if we're going for promotion or if we're realistic about our chances. Yeah, because looking at the division in general, like it's a, uh, it nearly reminds you of the old Division One in many ways because you've got so many big hitters in there. Like, and you're looking at Derry who are coming up and they're flying at the minute. A lot of people probably have them maybe going for promotion. Awfully are on on the back of a under twenty All Ireland win. You might see a few of those players yeah. in there as well. And Cork have a new manager. I'm sure they're going to improve. Galway or Common. We know the talent they have, and like what you said, they're clear. They're the side that seem to always cause a a shock and surprise or two in, in Division 2. So, I mean, it's going to be tough in there. Like, It is. It is. It's always tough. Um, and, and unfortunately for me, they've, you know, they've dropped once, possibly was it once, I think, during Seamus McEnany's tenure to Division 3. And we've obviously jumped up to Division 1 once. But for most of the last 15 years, the time in which I've been following me in earnest, we've been sort of stuck in Division 2, never quite good enough to get up but not quite bad enough to to be relegated in that as well we've been consistent but i think mead supporters are nearly sick of, not sick of playing the same teams but there is a real novelty and and great feel to go in and play in dublin and crow park or going down to play kerry and killarney or you know up to bally buffet to play donegal that's something that mead fans have been longing for for a while now and okay we didn't get any results but we were we really enjoyed our Division One um, experience in 2019, and, and it served us well. I thought. Um, so I look at Andy. Andy knows that too. He knows that if we're realistic about beating Dublin and challenging for All Ireland Championships, we need to be operating now in Division One and, and you know consolidating there. That's that's going to be the key for us. Yeah, and I suppose you've seen, I suppose, how competitive he's were. I suppose when he's went up to Division One and some of the the good games you got, and how probably stood to you, like you were saying before. I suppose, is there a worry there, there, though, as well, like given Tier 2 coming in 
and given, I suppose, the competitiveness of Division 2 and how competitive it is in there. And obviously, when you look at the Leinster Championship, they haven't done the semi-final draw yet. But if there was a circumstance where Dublin and Mead played each other in the semi-finals and Mead somehow went down to Division 3, all of a sudden, Mead are in a, a Tier 2 competition. So is there a bit of a worry there maybe as well that you probably need to start the, the division kind of fast because, like what you said, you could end up chasing and all of a sudden you're in a, a relegation fight? Yeah, I mean that that would be unthinkable to be honest with you. And and just to reference Cavan again, like you know they they're two years away from Division Two if all goes to plan. You know being in Division Four, so that's a hammer blow unless they get to a, a an Ulster final. I think I'm right in saying they'll be in that tier two. And you know, the, Cavan and Mead, you could say probably are on par in terms of championship performance. But yet there's two divisions between us, so you're quite right in what you say. It is it is hugely important for me not to obviously slump down to division three or get relegated or anything like that so that we'll you know be in tier one um, and also for the young players coming through Paul because you, you kind of want to give them the ble- best platform to come into the squad like they, they've been operating at the top tier at minor and hopefully under 20 level and for them to be coming into a meet senior setup and to be going into a tier two I, I don't think it would be the best sort of start for them. Whereas if they're coming in fresh after playing top level underage football to be coming in at playing at a, at a first, first tier level or division one level, if you will, I think that would really stand to them. And it would actually create a sort of culture there for, for young players coming in that this is the level that you have to be at and get to straight away, as opposed to maybe what players have been coming into over the last 10 or 15 years. There is definitely a gap there. Yeah, and I suppose for Andy McEntee, like he's definitely introduced a lot of younger players coming into the squad in the last couple of seasons, like Cahill Hickey and Jordan Morris and Matthew Costello and a few others. Yeah. Do you think there'll be many other players that might break into the team this year? Or do you think maybe he'll go with a more of a settled squad, I suppose, similar enough to the squad, I suppose, he's used for the past two years now? Yeah, I think so. I, I think Seamus Lavin could be one such player who, who may be going travelling and he, he's been excellent for us at cornerback for the last number of years. So he'll leave a big void. But uh, James O'Hare, I believe, is in on the panel. He was uh, Mead under 20 captain uh, this year. So he's going to go in and hopefully he could slot straight in. He's a, he's a great talent. He comes from the same club as Donald Kyogen and Rakenny. So he, we'd expect big things from him. And Billy Hogan, who's an interesting one, he was actually the Mead minor goalie from 2020, which obviously spilled into this year. Um, his brother, Harry, started against Dublin in the senior uh, semi-final this year. So the two of them could be competing for the number one jersey, the two Hogan brothers. So that, that could be interesting as well. They're the two kind of young players that I know about going in. I know Neil Kane is in. Uh, he, was, he was there a couple of years ago. He took a year out to recover from injury. And Gavin McGowan, who's... Uh, a very good dual player from the Rato club. He'll go in there and I'd expect him to uh, push for a starting place as well. We, we do still have a couple of clubs going strong. The likes of Trim are in a Leinster final at intermediate level. So there may well be a couple of players to go in from Trim, but at the moment they're obviously still going strong at the provincial. So we'll just have to wait and see on that one. But I would say much more of the same with, with maybe three or four additions, but the big influx will probably come maybe this time next year or the year after. And ultimately looking at Division 2 then, what do you think? Do you think you will be promoted? Do you think you'll be up there? And I suppose if so, who do you who do you reckon will be up there alongside you? Because I suppose it is a very hard one to call. <laughs> well, from the outset looking in, I'd, I'd say Galway and Roscommon will be the two big hitters in it, you know, and, and realistically then you need to win one of the two games. So... God forbid we lose to Galway. You need to be beating Roscommon in Navan and winning the rest of your games, essentially, to be guaranteed promotion. Um, that's not to discount Cork, who have been improving. And as you mentioned, Derry have been excellent, you know, and, and really are a young team, obviously, with the under-18 uh, success, which they had only last year. You know, they'll be coming through at, at a rate of not. So it's going to be difficult, but I would say the two big hitters will be the two Connacht sides and... I would still fancy me to negotiate Derry and Cork in Navan if push came to shove. So promotion is is the goal. I don't mind if we finish in first or second. I'll, I'll take either, to be honest. Yeah, I suppose you'll get a day out in, in Crow Park then as well, I suppose, yeah. and all the rest. And 
looking at the Leinster Championship then, I know it's a, a long time away away yet and there might be injuries and, and whatnot since then, but you've Leisha Wicklow obviously in the quarterfinals. I suppose you'd fancy yourselves to negotiate your way through that. And obviously the semi-final draw hasn't happened as of yet. And obviously that doesn't happen until after the quarterfinals for some strange reason. But I don't like mm. what what's the aim then, do you think, in, in, in the Leinster Championship this year for Mead? I mean, it's a, an interesting one because I don't know if you'd think you could finally take that step and beat Dublin or is it to be competitive again again or, or what do you think? Yeah, it's it's a tricky one. Um I, I do and I said this last year, I did like the idea of playing Dublin in the semi final as opposed to the final because certainly with the qualifiers back in, if you are to to lose to Dublin in the semi finals, it gives you an opportunity to to go on a run. Whereas, you know, when years gone by and we've lost to Dublin or, or got it beaten by Dublin in the Leinster final, you have to go out in the fourth round of the qualifier against a team that's after winning, you know, two or three on the spin in the, in that many weeks. So you're up against it. Whereas if you're if you kind of lose in the semi final, you have an opportunity to start winning games and come through that way. Um won't be looking past the first day because I know Billy Sheehan is is after taking the leash job and I'd expect them to be uh, a rejuvenated outfit going into next year. So that could be a difficult enough game if it, if it comes to pass. Uh, the idea, I think, with this, with Leinster is that they want to try and create a little bit more excitement. I, I don't know if that's... But but they don't want to do the semi-final draw because they want to try and make the quarterfinals a little bit more. I, you know, I, I don't really get it, to be honest with you either, but it is what it is. Um, obviously, we'd have a little bit of beef with Kildare as well. You know, we'd, we'd probably like a little bit of redemption at them and that could be a decent semi-final pairing if we were to get them and that and, and hopefully then beat them and, and go on to challenge Dublin in the final. But I, I think I think that's too far away. I think, obviously, he won't, Andy won't look past kind of the league first and foremost and then it'll be Leash or, Leash or Wicklow or, or Wexford. Is it possibly in the, in the quarter-final? Yeah, I think Leash or Wicklow from what I've seen, but it could be it could be Wexford, I think. I think Dublin are playing either Offaly or, or Wexford, I think. But yeah, like what you said there, yeah, it, it is a bit bizarre that they don't have the semi-final draw. It's almost like they're admitting there is a, a problem there in the Leinster yeah. Championship and the way it's structured, but they don't want to actually admit it. So this is their own kind of yeah. way of coming out and saying it. Like, Yeah, I look at it, it is. And, and to be honest, you can see the... You could see that there is probably an issue. I would say games like last year, certainly in, in what Mead and Dublin was, um, that that maybe it's coming Dublin are coming back to the pack a little bit more. And certainly in Leinster, that would be welcome. I, I still think, I don't know what Dublin are, are, are they going for, 12 in a row now in Leinster next year. Um think so, yeah. I've, I've nearly lost count so, on this stage, which yeah. probably tells you. And, and that's it. And, and like it's, it's really horrible for the rest to see... Not how little Leinster means, but you know it's it's routine now for Dublin, and they almost treat Leinster like most teams treat the Auburn Cup, and that and that's not uh, that's not great for anyone, uh, including Dublin. And it probably ha- it, that's probably been their downfall in in recent years, anyways, going into an All Ireland quarter final or semi final and not getting a test. Whereas if you look at Ulster, Tyrone or whoever it is that comes through Ulster every year. They're battle hardened, you know, from right from the first round to the to the Ulster final, they've had a test, you know, and even in Connacht, you could make a case for them with Galway, Mayo, and Roscommon. So hopefully Leinster is gonna is gonna be competitive again. And if it's not, I think you're right. I think probably something has to be done to 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 sort of shake things up at provincial levels. What were your thoughts on the proposal B format as well? And the restructuring of the, the championship and whatnot and making, I suppose, provincial competitions, pre-season tournaments. Like there was definitely mixed opinion in some ways, but I think a lot of people probably were in favour of it because I think a lot of people probably agree that it probably is time for some sort of change and maybe it wasn't the best change, but what was your thoughts on it? I thought it was probably the best on the table, to be honest, which I, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> Um, I don't think anybody really does at the moment, but I know Conor O'Donoghue, who's a who's a mead man from Dubai, and he was at the heart of that sort of proposal. B and uh, I remember he was over St Peter's Dubai, and the day that that proposal was defeated, they were actually playing in. A, I think it was a semi final of the championship of mead, and I was talking to him after. He was bitterly disappointed, but he was saying, you know, it's it's not the end of it. You know, the, this will they will come again and they will tweak a few things and try and make it a little bit more appetizing. But from, from 
most people that I was speaking to and, and players alike, they all seem to be, you know, mostly in favour of Proposal B. There was a few that were happy enough with the status quo, which is what we're going to go with. But I think it needed 60, was it 60% or it needed so, a big yeah. percentage or to actually or swing it. Yeah. That, that, that's huge. Do you know, like to, to get 60 or 70% of the, the backing from across the board is is massive. And like, ultimately, I think the big counties are, are probably always going to, I liken it to maybe what I I know you're a soccer fan as well. What Jurgen Klopp is saying about the five substitutions in the Premier League at the minute, and the big clubs are all backing that, but the smaller clubs are saying, "Hang on a second, you know we don't have a squad to compete with that." Whereas it's probably a polar opposite in the GA. The smaller clubs are are crying out for this. The smaller counties rather, but the big ones are, are probably saying, "Well, this it's grand the way it is. We're happy out." And ultimately, until they get everyone on the same him sheets that there's always going to be that disparity there unfortunately so that's going to be the issue yeah i suppose there is that conflict like teams are always going to look after themselves and their own best interests and in, in many ways and yeah. like what you said yeah you're seeing that in, in soccer and you're probably even seeing that when they done that whole super league crack you know that was going on there yeah. a couple yeah. of months ago you know so unfortunately that probably is the way it is it probably they probably do need to find something maybe that kind of benefits all all counties which I suppose it's easier said than done because there's always going to be that contradiction if you you know if you, if you create a system that suits the the big teams maybe like the super eights for example which i think was very unfavorable for the big teams then it's not going to be unfavorable for the lesser teams but then if you do something like this you know it's going to be more it, it's going to go against the, the big side so i suppose it's about kind of finding that balance i suppose yeah, because, and I do see it, you know, from, from some counties' perspectives. For example, you know, if you finish bottom of Division 1, I think it was, you were out of the championship. Whereas if you won, I think, Division 3 or possibly even Division 4, you were in a provisional quarter final at the All-Ireland or something. So there is a little bit of that there. And obviously for the likes of Mead as well, um, you know, if we were to go up to Division 1 and finish bottom of it next year, then you'd be in that scenario. But I know me did back Proposal B and, and they were kind of vocal enough in the sport of it. Um, but I do think I do think something needs to be done because it, it's probably not even me or, or Kildare or anyone like that. It's the it's the Carlos and Wicklows of the world or Sligos who or Leitrim's. Ultimately, like we've seen what Mayo did to Leitrim in Connacht last year, it was horrendous and what's the incentive for them lads to go out and, and sort of the same thing happen to them year after year and maybe get a game in the qualifiers then and that's their year done and dusted. So certainly there is there is something there. They're never going to win in All-Ireland realistically. It's never going to be a fairy tale story like that, unfortunately. And I think the big teams are only going to get bigger and stronger and the lesser teams are probably only going to get weaker because more lads are going to be kind of turned off the idea of playing inter-county football. So... It will eventually, I think, happen and they, they, there won't be a choice. They'll just have to go with it. Yeah, and I suppose turning our attention then to the overall All-Ireland big picture, who would you see as the, the front runners for the All-Ireland at this moment in time? I suppose last year, I mean, not many people could have predicted Tyrone to go all the way and, and win it in the way that they did. And you had Mayo beating the dubs, which I'm sure you secretly enjoyed. And then obviously, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then obviously, yeah. Uh, well, a Kerry as well. I mean, I'm sure they're going to look good next year as well. Yeah, I, I kind of always fancy Kerry. I say it every year, but I was I was really disappointed with the way their year sort of petered out. Uh, because I actually thought it opened up for them with, with Dublin being knocked out and that as well. And Mayo did flatter to deceive in the final, as as so often has been the case. Look at Tyrone were Tyrone were excellent, and you kind of have to credit them for picking everybody off. But realistically, for 2022, if you ask most neutrals, I don't think Tyrone are going to be in the top three or four of their picks. You know, they mightn't even be their picks for Ulster. You know, I think Tony Gall are going to be fairly strong in Ulster. I actually think Armagh are going to be a decent side as well and, and tough to beat in Ulster. Um, I do think Mayo will be there thereabouts again. It's hard to look past Dublin, certainly in terms of Leinster, and they're going to probably come back with that added bit of hunger, which may be wasn't there last year maybe that's going to be the best thing that ever happened to them that defeat and it might just drive them on to to go again um i just think kerry have that sort of mercurial talent but ultimately they do rely so heavily on clifford and we seen when he went off in the semi-final last year against Tyrone, they, they couldn't kind of conjure up the scores that they needed to to get over the line that day so 
Um, it's it's going to be an interesting one, but uh, I think it's wide open, to be honest with you, Paul. I, I genuinely think you could make a case for four, five, six teams um, across the country that, that could definitely challenge. It's probably the most open it has been in a number of years. Yeah, probably, like you said there, like probably the most open championship maybe since maybe since 2010 or, you know, I know it's a start yeah, of 2010. Yeah, I don't yeah. think, um, I think I don't think many people expected that championship to be as open as it was. As, as it was that, but, that was Cork, was it? Yeah, it was Cork who, who beat down in the in the All Ireland yeah. final that year and, and and all the rest. Like so, yeah, it could be it could be extremely wide open, and they're saying it could be a lot of trills, spills, shocks, and, and surprises along the way. Like you've probably got four or five counties in in Ulster that probably fancy their chances, and I think I think at the moment Tyrone are like the four favourites to win the All Ireland, which might be the I suppose the most least favoured team, most least favoured champion going into an All Ireland yeah. series. So. Um, I'd imagine it would be wide open. I suppose just touching on the Mead hurlers briefly. Then I mean, yeah. I suppose mainly focusing on that win against Kildare at the end of the Joe McDonough Cup because that was definitely a result. I think it surprised a lot of people, including myself. Like Kildare were definitely the team that looked like they were building. I remember they were on the tougher side of the of the draw as well, and in the Joe McDonough with would it be in group stages. So that was a huge win, I suppose, to solidify Joe McDonough Cup status for another year. Yeah, it was brilliant. It was it was really really good the way the year went. Uh, it was a, a really tough league campaign. Some hammerings along the way. I think um, Offley and Carlo in in Navan gave Mead some horrendous drubbings really, and there was a little bit of unrest in the panel as well. A couple of guys exited before the start of the Joe McDonough, but they they had a training camp. They had a good few heart to hearts and. They went into that campaign with great confidence. They lost against Down the first day out. I actually seen that game. They were very good. A little bit unlucky to be beaten. Then they beat Kerry and Navin, which was massive. Kerry actually needed a result to, as it turned out, they still got to the final of the Joe McDonough, but they were blessed to do so because of the score difference. They, they got through by a solitary point. Mead beat them. Mead were outstanding that day in Navin. Best performance I've seen them. And it was their first ever Joe McDonough win. But then they were still in the relegation and they were playing a Kildare side who I think the week before were the beaten by a point against Westmead, the eventual champions, and um, they were outstanding in that. So th- there were odds on favourites to beat Mead, but Mead went into that game with confidence and, and really did a job on Kildare, to be honest with you. Back-to-back wins, you know, Nick Weir, you know, obviously carries on. Uh, they've got Saoirse Bulfin, who's going in there now. He's worked with David Fitzgerald at Clare and, and Wexford, very well-touted coach. Um, settled enough panel with a couple of nice additions as well. So I, I actually think that they could they could go well. The under 20s won an All Ireland uh, B Championship as well. So there's going to be a few of those guys coming up. The likes of James Murray is an outstanding talent from Trim. He's going to be in there as well. So um, it's going to be really tough. Don't get me wrong. I think Adrum are coming down and you have Offley coming up from the Christie mm. Ring. So along with the likes of your Kerry's and downs of this world so it's going to be really really tough but I actually think they're in good nick mead and I'd expect them to hopefully kick on and challenge again yeah I suppose it'll probably be one of the toughest John McDonough Cup Cups in I suppose a long time really because you like what you said Antrim coming down we've seen the quality that they showed in Division 1 last year awfully come yeah. up we've seen what they obviously done in the Christie ring and obviously haven't played yourselves in the league last year so going to be super competitive like down are certainly on the rise as well Carlo are always there or thereabouts so I mean it's going to be tough yeah. in that Joe McDonough Cup like do you think you'd be mainly just fighting to stay in the division or, or how do you see it panning out? Yeah, I think I think yeah, probably realistically, but I know the way they are in there, and that they'll be tagging the run at it, and it, it'll probably all depend on how they start the campaign. It it is unforgiving, and you know, one defeat can kind of throw you off the rails again. Um, but it, it is most definitely probably the the most entertaining and competitive cup competition in in the hurling circles. You know, the All Ireland there is still a little bit of a. Um, a one-sided nature probably in, in Leinster at, at certain stages as well but in terms of talking about even keels or level playing fields and teams that are going up to to be competitive I, th- I think it's great a good friend of mine plays at Westmead and I know for a fact they're delighted to be out of it because um, because of the teams that are in it this year you know Offaly are coming up and make no mistake about it they'll probably go in as joint favourites to maybe win it you know, they are a sleeper giant and the way they kind of dispatched everything in their wake in the Christie ring, that a great league campaign as well. 
and they're going to be a really tough nut to crack. So, um, I think a lot's going to depend on how you how you hit the ground running, and and for me, that's going to be trying to trying to start off with a win. I think the league campaign is is important as well. The last couple of years, they've been just about doing enough to maintain their status, um, but they're going to have to try and be a little bit more competitive against the sides in which they'll be playing later on in the summer uh, at an earlier stage this year. Um, and I think I think Nick and and Saoirse and, and the management team in there will put a bit of bit more emphasis on that. Um, and it's a settled squad. And the biggest thing now is there's lads in there who want to be in there. You know, there's not going to be any more fallouts or any more sort of, um, you know, rows in the camp. That that probably didn't help anyone last year. And thankfully, I think he is a settled squad now to work with. Yeah, and I suppose looking at the overall All-Ireland big picture, I mean, I don't think the question really is who do you think will win the All-Ireland? I think the question now is can anyone stop Limerick? You know, it's probably... It's probably becoming a bit like Dublin, you know, can anyone stop Dublin? And and that's kind of, I suppose that's the way it is now in the, in the All-Ireland, you know, the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship. They, they are the the hurling equivalent, really, of, of what Dublin have done in, in years gone by. And even the, the physicality and um how, how strong they are, strength and depth, the, the backing they have probably financially as well is, is making them an absolutely extraordinary animal. I do think the likes of Henry Shefflin going to Galway and, and them getting pitted with Kilkenny in the Leinster is probably going to put a little bit of a, a romantic feel on it as well. And, the, you know, the likes of Dublin probably have, you'd, you'd imagine, have will have something to say, Wexford as well. Um, in, in Munster, Cork, I think, will be hurting after that final defeat. I think they were better than what the shows. Tipperary, you'll, you'll remember, were the 10 or 12 points up against Limerick in, in the Munster last year. So, you know, they'll certainly feel that they have something to offer um, new managers well going in there too. So um, it, it's going to be interesting. It, it's obviously going to be hard to look past Limerick, of course, but I, I do think the chase and pack are very much on, on a level playing field and anyone could kind of come out. But I, th- I don't think too many would have predicted Cork would have come out of it last year. Um, and it's probably open for the likes of a Galway to come out there this year. If, if Henry can get a tune out of them, I think they could go well. Yeah, I suppose Galway were the. I suppose one, well, they beat Limerick in the league last year, and they've generally had a when when the two have played each other, it definitely has been close. So you'd probably look at them, or, or maybe a Waterford or a Cork, like you said before. I suppose before we finish up the We Are Me podcast, how did you get started with that? And I suppose where can where can people find the podcast if they're I suppose looking to I suppose hear about all things Mead. Yeah, so it's very much a Mead based podcast. So I suppose it mightn't appeal to. To anyone else, what, what we have seen sometimes is you've seen, you know, management or, or journalists or commentators maybe sign up to the podcast in the week leading up to a big game to find out a bit <laughs> of team news or what's going on or that kind of thing. But basically, it's all things me to cover club and county, uh, ladies, lads, camogie, hurling, everything you can imagine. We're probably at it maybe three or four years now. Um, it's kind of spiraled from that. We do a, a free to air podcast every week that goes out on SoundCloud or um, Spotify or wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcast as well. And we do have a Patreon podcast as well. So that's our Loyal Royals podcast. And we would release two to three extra episodes. That's where all your post-match, pre-match interviews will go, the analysis, etc. So you can get that at Patreon forward slash We Are Me. It's four euro fifty a month to sign up and you'll get kind of all the access to all the the, the juicy bits, as you know, Paul. So uh, that's where you can get that and sign up. And yeah, it's going well, thankfully. Perfect, Davey. Well, look, listen, I appreciate you jumping on. And um, yeah, cheers for coming on. Appreciate your time. Yeah, and best wishes for 2022. You're doing a great job as well. And we look forward to hopefully meeting you for uh, for a chat before the Leinster semi-final or, or final all going well. Perfect, Davey. Sound.